Hello, everyone. My name is John Bachman. I'm the executive director of an organization called Animal Charity Evaluators. We work to find and promote the most effective ways to help animals. Thank you to Anthony for giving a great talk there, and it's a great introduction to what I'm going to talk about here now. We come from very different backgrounds, but I think we share a lot of the same goals, so I look forward to talking to you here today. Why do you care about this presentation? The answer is that you care about animals and you want to help them. And I'm here to tell you how you can help as many animals as possible. I challenge each one of you today, when you leave this room, to ask yourself difficult questions about what you're doing to help animals and if there's not something better that you can do with your time and money to help more of them. We're going to talk about three things today. One, there are so many different areas where animals need help. How can we decide which area to focus on? Two, once you've decided you want to help animals, what are the most effective interventions or the best ways to approach helping animals? And three, what charities should you look for for advice and to support when trying to be as effective as possible? So when we look at what cause we should focus on, we need to think about numbers. And a lot of those numbers are gained through research and examining things like Anthony was talking about. We believe that the area where you can achieve the greatest gains for animals is farm animal advocacy, and I'm going to talk about why. If you look at this chart, you'll see the number of land animals killed in the United States every year. 99 out of 100 animals that are killed in the United States are killed for food. Looking at this other chart, this brings in another interesting factor to consider. Again, 99% of the animals used by humans in the United States are farm animals, whereas less than 1% are other animals. But if we take a look at the allocation of donations to different animal charities, we see a very concerning picture. We see that farm animal charities, charities that directly work on farm animal issues, are actually only getting about 1% of the funding that is given to animal charities. Whereas other animals, which account for about 1% of the total animals that are being used in the United States, get 99% of the funding. Now that's a real and serious gap that we need to address. Let me talk about another area that's important to consider, and that's cost effectiveness. I've spent the last decade working in a variety of nonprofit jobs to help animals, from animal shelters to wildlife rehabilitation to humane investigation to farm animal advocacy. What I can tell you from all my years is this. We need to consider how much we're spending on each animal that we save. Take shelters, for example, that rescue either cats or dogs or even farm animals. When I worked at a cat and dog rescue, it ended up costing us about $300 per animal to save an animal. Now, that may seem like an easy decision in a lot of instances. For example, if your choice is to buy the new Xbox or the latest iPod or to help the stray dog that is otherwise going to die, I think everyone in this room is going to choose to save that dog. It's an easy choice there. However, let's look at another area. Let's look at wildlife rehabilitation. Again, an area where I spent five years of my life. I worked at two different centers, and I can tell you that it cost us about $30 to save an individual animal and release it healthy back into the wild. That's a pretty big difference from how much it costs to save a cat or a dog in a shelter. Let's look at another area, farm animals. Using the research we do have on leafleting, which is a popular intervention to help farm animals, our best guess is that for a little over $10, you can save 30 animals. Now, we're uncertain about this number because the research is simply not as rigorous as it should be, and we are open to that. But even if you reduce that by a factor of 10, say we are 10 times in the wrong direction with that number, we are still talking about spending $10 to save three and a third animals, or to, to save three animals. That is still $3.33 per animal saved with farm animal advocacy, even if you give our numbers that big a margin of error. Now, I'll be the first to admit we need to do a lot more research in this area, but these numbers bear consideration when we choose what to advocate for. Another consideration is the law. We do have an Animal Welfare Act on the book to protect animals. It helps protect against abuse and neglect of animals, and it's a good thing that we have that. 
The problem is the Animal Welfare Act excludes farm animals. So according to the Animal Welfare Act, which is supposed to be our guiding legislation to help animals, farm animals do not equal animals. We do have one federal law in the book called the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, and this does suggest that livestock be killed as humanely as possible, whatever that means, but it's something, right? It's, okay, at least there's some sort of federal measure being taken to help farm animals. The problem with that is the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act does not include birds or fish, which account for the vast majority of the animals that are raised for food. So based on the really extremely high numbers of farm animals, the extremely low amount of donations that farm animal charities get, and the non-existent laws to protect farm animals, we believe that farm animal advocacy is the area where you can have the greatest impact. Now, a question I immediately get when we talk about things like this is, what's wrong with helping them? What's wrong with helping, helping cats? What's wrong with helping dogs? Or what's wrong with helping animals used in research? Or in entertainment, or any of these things? And while, in fact, I absolutely don't think there's anything wrong with helping them, I'm going to answer the question of why we should be asking ourselves questions like that. You see, here's the problem. Most of us have some experience with a cat or a dog, or we have one at home, and it was probably adopted from our local shelter. Our local shelter is part of our community. We know people on the staff. We might know a board member. We see animals from our community going into that shelter and coming out and living happy, healthy, full lives in homes. So that's easy for us to relate to. We've grown up with cats and dogs. We see the direct translation of money going into that charity and producing loving homes for animals. Conversely, you know that other opportunities exist to help animals. You know that animals are abused in research labs. You know that animals are abused in entertainment and for food. But you don't know the first thing about those animals, right? You don't know they weren't part of your neighborhood. There's not a center in your community that you can go to and see those animals and see what they're like. And on top of all that, you wouldn't know where to start. So when you volunteer your time to help animals, you volunteer at the local shelter. Again, in answer to this question, there is nothing wrong with helping those animals. Some of the people I respect and admire in my entire life have focused all their efforts to them, and I think they've made a real difference for the animals they've dealt with. However, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be asking ourselves these questions. That doesn't mean we shouldn't consider, can I be more effective? Can I shift some of my resources to these other charities that are most in need and where I can have the biggest impact to help the largest number of animals. The same thing goes for your donations. Again, you see that animal shelter in your community, so it makes sense for you to donate to them. I'm not saying you should give all that up, but I'm saying I would like you to rethink where your money is going and where your time's going and redistribute some of that to these effective causes I'm here to talk about. If you don't know which groups to contact, Animal Charity Evaluators is a great resource for that. We offer lots of great information on our site. Our advice, in charities on, our advice on charities and on what to do for them is based on the concept of effective altruism. This is a philosophical and social movement of trying to essentially create the greatest good. Now, think of this as a very simple equation. How do I take my time and add it to my money to equal the greatest possible good, to help the largest number of animals. And that's what guides our principles. And that's what I would like to guide some of yours. And based on that, we recommend farm animal advocacy. Let's talk a little bit about what you should do for the cause. Now, we certainly don't have time to go through all the different interventions that are used to help farm animals as much as I would like to but I'm going to give you a, some guidelines to help you through the process. First of all, I do want to put a, a note out there that on our site we do have pages on career and volunteer advice that go into a lot more detail than I have time to today. I, I invite you to explore those. First, I want to start off with a little bit of a story. So when I was growing up, I loved sports. I was all about sports. I wanted to win. 
I gave everything I did 110%. I was the kid in fifth grade who bolted for the bleachers when the ball was going out of bounds, dove into the bleachers, rescued the ball in bounds, got all bruised up, and that was the first day of practice for the year. <laughs> in fact, I actually got the only award our school gave for sports, which was most inspirational. But most inspirational does not mean most effective. I continued this into my adult activism career. I wanted to help as many animals as possible, so I got out there and did as much as I possibly could. I helped animals in shelters. I protested animals used in research. I leafleted. I helped wildlife. I did food demonstrations, humane education, you name it. I went out there, and I did it. Karen Dawn actually gave me the advice at one point when I was very new to this that don't be so worried about what you're going to do. Do something. Don't do nothing. Don't sit there back and worry about it. Do something. And so I did. And that worked great for a while. But now that I've been through all that, I'm here to share the lessons that I've learned from that so you can be as effective as possible in your own work. Now, I, as I mentioned at the beginning of this section, I would love to talk more specifically about the interventions involved and some of the ones that, that are up here today, but we just simply don't have time. The problem, that, the problem in this area is that there's very, very little research on what we can do to help animals and farm animals. We simply don't have the rigorous data that the big corporations that we're competing against have. We don't even have anywhere close but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be starting to try to do that and trying to collect that information and learning from our mistakes. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later in a little more detail. When we've made our recommendations for charities, we tend to go with groups that work in a wide array of areas for that exact reason. Because we're uncertain about one intervention being the end all, we try to pick groups that are focusing a lot of different areas in which we think there's a high likelihood they're going to be effective. Essentially, we do have some research on leafleting, online vegetarian ads, and humane, and humane education on our site, but the data is not rigorous. That being said, we are confident enough to recommend something like leafleting because it's incredibly cheap and it's incredibly easy. This is something where you could be at work and you decide you want to make a difference for animals, and you could go out during your lunch break and hand out leaflets at a college campus and reach a couple hundred people in a very, very simple and time of, timely way. I want to put up this chart here provided from data from Nick Cooney's Veganomics. This is looking at the percentage of days of suffering that are avoided by different types of diets. Now, this is something that's really important for us to consider when we're advocating for animals. Now, if you look at the vegan diet, of course, that's avoiding 100% of the days of suffering of animals in factory farms. If you look at the vegan accepted dairy column, so people who are vegan but still eat cheese and milk, they're preventing a vast majority of the days of suffering in factory farms too. 89% for vegetarian and 84% for those who cut out fish and poultry. What's really interesting is this last column where those who only give up red meat are actually only preventing about 4% of the days of suffering of animals in factory farms. Now, that's a tremendous jump from those who are not consuming red meat to those who are not consuming chicken and fish. So when we're out there advocating for farm animals, we have to realize that every person is coming from a different point in their life. Okay? I, raised, I was raised in a home where 21 meals a week were meat-based. If a meal did not have a piece of meat on it, it wasn't a meal. I, just, I would complain and I would be unhappy because I didn't know any better. And we have to remember there are people that are coming from that environment. So some people are not going to be ready to turn vegan tomorrow or not going to be ready to turn vegetarian, but perhaps they're ready to give up chicken or ready to give up fish. And by looking at data like this, we can make the decision to ask them to give up something that's going to spare a lot more suffering versus giving up something like red meat. Additionally, there's mixed studies on this as to whether or not red meat is replaced with other vegetables or chicken and fish, but the fact is that some of it is replaced by chicken and fish. So those who give up red meat are likely actually increasing the amount of suffering in factory farms. This is something that's important for us to consider. Another thing you should really consider in your outreach is social psychology. One such example is the foot-in-the-door technique. 
This is suggests that if you make a small ask, people might be more likely to comply with a larger ask later on. Now, there's lots of studies that support this, and I can tell you from a direct experience, this is actually what worked on me. I got an earlier version of this vegan outreach pamphlet on the left, and the, it's a little blurry, but it says, by just cutting your meat consumption in half, you can spare the suffering of hundreds of animals. I was not ready to be vegan when I got this message, but I was ready to make a difference for animals. I saw that treatment, I said, I can't support that. So I took the small step, I went vegetarian, I went vegan, so that worked for me. That being said, some other people, it's going to work differently. There's another type of uh, technique called door in the face, where you start with a very large ask and then scale it back with a smaller ask. That th the idea being that the large ask will seem much too much for them to take on, but the smaller ask might be something they can accept. Now, the take-home message here is not that you should use one or the, the other in every single situation, but that we should be using social psychology to guide our work. I want to put a a plug out for Nick Cooney's Change of Heart. It's a really valuable book I think all activists should read. We also need to be thinking about the impact that we can make as an individual. No matter how pure your vegan diet is, no matter how closely you look for honey or for a trace of milk in the bread at the table at the restaurant, you are only going to be able to save a finite number of animals. Right now the number is at 28 chickens a year. It fluctuates. But you're, no matter how careful you are, you're only going to be able to save 28 chickens and a small percentage of various other animals. However, if you spend your time convincing other people to adopt a compassionate diet, now we're talking about real change. Now we're talking about a movement to help animals. So if we really want to make a difference, we need to not just stop and stop at our diet, but we need to go out there and make a difference with the public and try and convince others. The last thing I want to talk about in this section is replaceability. So this is a really important concept for people that are considering going into various careers. Let's use Susie here as a, as a fictitious example. So Susie is in vet school right now. It's a very competitive area. She's doing very well. She's not at the bottom of her class. She's not at the top, but she's in the top half, maybe the 70th or 80th percentile. So she's, she's doing very well. Ask yourself, what would happen if Susie no longer existed? So we've got that, that tier of the 50th to the 100th percentile of that class. What would happen if Susie was taken out and just no longer existed? Well, because it's a highly competitive field, whoever is slightly less qualified than her would be bumped up and simply take the job that she would have otherwise taken. That means she's highly replaceable in a job like that. Let's take a look at some other professions, though. Let's take a look at someone who wants to go into finance or the banking industry and make lots of money. Again, that's very competitive. Let's say this person is, again, in that upper half, uh, and let's say we take them out of existence. Again, someone's just going to bump up, take their spot, and there's not going to be that much difference in the world. That person is highly replaceable. However, if that person intends to donate lots of money, especially to effective charities, now we're talking about a very low level of replaceability. Because if that person gets taken out of the equation and he had planned on donating lots of his money, the next person that fills those shoes is likely not going to take that approach. So that person has become very valuable in what they do. And indeed, Susie can become more valuable in her profession if she uses it in a way that helps animals, either through donations or using her expertise to lend to groups and things like that. One last area I'll ask you to consider is people who go into nonprofit fields like the one I'm in and the one that many of you are in. Now, that's an area where you usually work very long hours and get very low pay, so it's not as desirable of an area. You're not going to have, and in addition to that, people need to have a passion in that field. So you're really going to have a much smaller section of talent to pull, pull from. So someone who goes and works for a nonprofit will also have low levels of replaceability if they bring a particularly valuable skill set. Now, unfortunately, I've got a couple minutes to go through other slides that I didn't have time to earlier, so I'm going to try and fly through this. What charities should I support? We use seven criteria to, to make our assessments of that. I don't have time to go through them in much detail here today, but stop by our table. We've got lots of great resources out there. Uh, one is room for more funding. We look at cost effectiveness, mission effectiveness, their understanding of success and failure, 
And here I have to put a plug out for a project that we've actually done with Humane Research Council recently called the Survey Guidelines Project. Uh, I want to put a call out to Catherine Asher, Asher in the back. She did a great job helping us with that project and was instrumental in making it come to fruition. But here's the problem. There are groups out there that are starting to analyze their work, which is great. But unfortunately, they're using different scales to do it. So one group might say, on a scale from 1 to 10, how much have you reduced your consumption of pork? And another, another group might say, okay, uh, your consumption of pork has A, decreased significantly, B, decreased slightly, uh, middle, uh, no change, so using a Likert scale. Those results are not comparable. So what we did is we really put in the time to develop a really high-quality set of food frequency questionnaires. We put in the time to develop a question bank of really carefully worded questions so that all groups can use the same set of questions to produce good quality data. Please do see me if you're interested in evaluation after this, and I can get you that information, and we can talk about how we can work together. This is a free service we provide, and we're happy to do so. The other areas we look at are a strong track record, strong leadership, and transparency. I do want to say that we're proud to recommend Mercy for Animals and the Humane League as our top charities right now. They scored very highly in those seven criteria, and I'd be happy to go into more detail if I had more time, but I don't. Again, please come see us at our table. I do want to put a shout-out to the other two organizations that were our standout organizations. That means they scored very highly, but for one reason or another weren't quite the top charities. Those two are the Farm Animal Rights Movement and the Farm Animal Protection Campaign of the Humane Society of the United States. Both very, very good groups doing very good work. But again, our top recommendations are Mercy for Animals and the Humane League. Just got one minute left. The last thing I want to talk about is who can help me to decide? Well, we are here, obviously, to help you. You know of Animal Charity Evaluators now. We're a fairly new group, but we're here to help you be as effective as possible. Ultimately, this decision is up to you, though. You decide how to spend your time and money through volunteering and donating. It's up to you to decide how effective you want to be. You know the facts that we've talked about today. You know which groups are in need of the most support. Please don't forget about this talk when you leave the room. This is an incredibly important topic that can create substantially more benefits for animals if we just ask ourselves these important questions. Please don't miss the opportunity to be more effective and to help as many animals as possible. Thank you.